a bit more about other MAOI drugs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, I did a, a piece on uh, phenylzine nardil a little while ago, which Heidi, now she's feeling a bit better, has uh, put up on the website. Uh, and there have been various questions about the other MAOIs. So let's get straight into the other MAOIs. More recently, of course, because of people's uh, apprehension about the old-fashioned MAOIs, which, as many of you will know, I've said repeatedly is exaggerated and somewhat misplaced, but partly because of that. There was a big effort back in the 70s and 80s to produce safer drugs, either by making them selective just for MAOB inhibition, uh, and thus uh, less likely to cause serotonin toxicity uh, or um, a tyramine reaction, uh, and secondly, uh, to make them reversible. Uh, and that was where the reversible MAOA inhibitors came in. Uh, Meclobamide, Auraryx, Manorix, whatever other trade names it's masqueraded under in the last few decades. can't remember even when that came in now, but it was quite a long time ago. Must have been the 80s, late 80s probably. Um, there were actually various other reversible MAO inhibitors like befloxetone and toloxetone. Um, probably a few others I don't even know about. Um, uh, as is so often the story with these drugs, you know, some of the trials... Uh, were successful and some weren't and that was often nothing to do with how good or bad the drug was it was more to do with chance which of course is why i don't think much of randomized control trials but that's another question altogether the irony is that say taloxetone uh, if i recall correctly was almost probably a rather better drug than meclobamide it was much more potent meclobamide was always uh, a um, dubious proposition, I think would be a good way of putting it, because it was uh, relatively weak and easily reversible. Uh, and what that means is, if it's reversible, then competition from another substrate for that enzyme can displace it from that enzyme. Uh, and, of course, you don't get any... <laughs> prizes for realising that the main substrate for the enzyme is 5-HT itself. Uh, because, of course, uh, 5-H, uh, MAOA uh, metabolises 5-HT. Uh, so that led some people, including me, to the early prediction uh, that there would be a limit to how much meclobamide would raise serotonin levels because once they were elevated to a certain degree, serotonin itself would displace uh, meclobamide from the enzyme uh, and it would thus not be effective. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I've emphasized this in a couple of the papers I've written about the mechanism of action of these drugs and what it tells us about what's happening and everything else. And of course, if you look, at both the interactions of meclobamide, but more particularly at what happens when people take overdoses of it. Uh, it doesn't matter how big an overdose of meclobamide you take, you don't get any sy symptoms of serotonin toxicity, or even symptoms of, you know, excess serotonin manifest by excessive side effects, if you like, uh, of a serotonin-related, uh, mediated uh, nature. Uh, so that's further evidence that meclobamide uh, doesn't increase anything very much at all. That's not necessarily a fault. I mean, it might be that you don't need to elevate serotonin very much to get the benefit of doing that, and that elevating it to a greater extent is more harmful than beneficial. Um, unfortunately, in my view, that's a very important aspect of these drugs and how the interventions that we're effecting 
do or don't work that has not been investigated properly. Um, but there you are. That's back to what I've often said about how poor a lot of the research in psychiatry is. Anyway, the long and the short of it is uh, the extent to which it elevates serotonin, uh, and I've reviewed the literature on how that compares to other drugs and other mixtures of drugs in the paper I published in Biological Psychiatry. Uh, but the long and the short of it is that however much it does it, which is a bit but not a great deal, it doesn't really seem to help people very much. By rights, meclobamide should have been an incredibly popular drug because it had very few side effects, uh, a very favourable, you know, acceptability profile, if you like. Um, but it just fell out of use. Uh, and I think, irrespective of what trials did or didn't show, I think the average practitioner who tried it just found over time that there were other things that appeared to be more effective and so people just stopped using it. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty simple practical judgment on how effective it was. You know, I think if that many doctors all over the world tried it and then just stopped using it, uh, it's difficult to postulate that they were all stupid and wrong, isn't it? Hmm? Although I have said sometimes in the past that doctors are often <laughs> less, than less than perspicacious and mistaken, if I can put it like that. But anyway, so that's meclobamide. It has a place, um, but not much of a place. You do occasionally see people who seem to get a good response to it. Um, uh, and there you are. It's occasionally worth a try. As far as combining it with other things is concerned, one of the great mistakes that everybody made early on was opining that it could be combined with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And indeed, various researchers, Hawley and Ebert and whoever else, um, did actually do trials combining meclobamide uh, with one or other of the new, at that time, new serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I remember warning one of them to get a pair of stout brown trousers when he told me he was going to do a trial of that, and he scorned me. Uh, next time I met him, he uh, had ceased the trial because uh, he ran out of brown trousers. <laughs> uh, you can get away with it sometimes, uh, but as soon as you get slightly higher doses of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, the chance of getting major serotonin toxicity is there. So that proves that the clobamide does something, but not much by itself, but add it to a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and it definitely can cause serotonin toxicity. And th there have been deaths, undoubtedly. Not many, but there have been. But you certainly can combine it with tricyclic antidepressants like nortriptyline. So in that sense, it's the same as the irreversible MAOIs. Uh, providing the drugs are not serotonin reuptake inhibitors, then you can combine it with various other things. And that may indeed be an underexplored use of meclobamide. I mean, for instance, it might be quite useful to try it in combination with selegiline, the MAOB inhibitor. Um, I've certainly had people who've inquired about that on the website and tried it. I can't claim that enough of them have done that and reported the results to me to make any useful statement uh, about whether experience bears out the theory of what I've just said. But uh, I think the chance of it being uh, harmful is so remote that in certain circumstances it may well be worth considering. So that's meclobamide. The other uh, drugs, oh, side effect wise, as I've already said, really pretty innocuous. Um, which is really, you know, a drug that doesn't have side effects probably doesn't have many effects at all. Is perhaps a trite way of summing it all up. The other uh, reversible drugs never really got on the market. I think one of them might have been marketed somewhere in Eastern Europe or something, but I believe they've all completely disappeared from therapeutic use, such as it might have been very, very limited in certain places a long good while ago now. Okay, 
So that's the reversible drugs. Uh, we, we've covered mixed drugs and Nardil and isocarboxazid. So that really leaves selegiline and rosagiline. Now, of course, selegiline uh, goes back a long, long way, almost to the beginning of my career. I remember the great story of Merton Sandler, who was the professor of chemical pathology at Queen Charlotte's in London, who I did some research with. He was a lovable rogue uh, and a founder, along with my ex-boss of the British Association of Psychopharmacology. Uh, and Mer I could tell some stories about Merton, goodness me. A lovable rogue, I think, is perhaps the best way of describing him. Uh, and one of the things he did early on was to go to, was it Hungary, wherever, you know, this, this selegiline stuff, Deprilas, I think it was called then, was discovered by Noll or whoever it was. I, I can't remember all the names off the top of my head. Uh, because he thought it was a jolly interesting thing. I mean, Merton was a really smart guy. And he went over there and he came back to the UK with you know, a kilogram of this stuff in a plastic bag. <laughs> and I think customs threatened, I think they threatened to arrest him and, you know, do nasty things to him. Um, but uh, in those days, you know, things weren't quite so silly. Uh, and he you know, got it to his laboratory and started doing experiments with it. I think there's some information, uh, if anybody happens to be interested, um, the International Network for the History of Neuropsychopharmacology. Uh, there's something about all this on their website, which got a lot of very valuable and, and interesting and erudite uh, discussion and conversation firsthand from many of these people who were involved in the early history of psychopharmacology. Many very famous names have contributed all sorts of interesting material to that website. It's worth looking at. Anyway, so, so selegiline uh, became a selective for MAOB. Uh, slight, well, not very selective, or three to one or five to one selective, something in that region, depending on who assays it and how they assay it. Um, but it got into use for uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and I don't know when they started using it for that, but a long, long time ago, because... In the early times of my uh, discussions about serotonin toxicity, I remember reviewing the data of the patients who'd been treated with selegiline oh, back in the 80s, I suppose it was, early 90s, um, uh, and who'd also been given antidepressants of various sorts. And what that showed, of course, was that they didn't get serotonin toxicity because the doses of selegiline they were using were selective uh, and uh, those patients in that group who'd been treated with uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors didn't get significant serotonin toxicity. But you do have to be careful, of course, because <clears throat> the ratio of its inhibition of the two subtypes of MAO is not that different. You only have to up the dose you know, a bit, and then it'll start blocking the, the uh a subtype as well uh, and then of course you'd have a drug that was more like an irreversible drug and you'd have all the interactions and problems associated with the other irreversible MAIs. Uh, so that's really selegiline. Uh, obviously it was developed or they developed a sublingual preparation didn't they? Um, we never had it over here in Australia uh, but a lot of these sublingual things aren't really absorbed sublingually. Mm. It's breakfast time here. I'm having my coffee. Um, uh, yes, so uh, not not that selective. Um, so rosagiline. Okay, uh, rosagiline was developed by um, I guess I'd call him my friend, John Finberg. Uh, I've been. Uh, in correspondence with John for many years now. And in fact, I wrote a book chapter with him um, to do with Rostagiline. And Rostagiline is much more selective, uh, uh, more like 10 to 1 selectivity. Um, so not super selective, but definitely sufficiently selective such that in all clinical use, uh, you can regard it as not effectively blocking MAOA, as only blocking MAOB. 
and that's now widely used in Parkinson's disease. I'm not sure how long it's been available for. It's a little while now. I suppose it must be around 10 years. Um, it really is true that as you get older, um, things that you think were only two or three years ago turn out to be five or 10 years ago. Wait for it, it'll come to you. Um, so yes, that, that's risagiline, uh, and um, obviously it's completely free from any risk of uh, uh, serotonin toxicity if you combine it with uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And um, it's uh, a good drug for Parkinson's, but it will work for depression if you use really large doses. And uh, one or two people who've contacted me from countries where they simply can't get the other MAOIs and who can afford it have used very large doses of risagiline in order to treat their depression. And it undoubtedly has worked, uh, which is exactly what you'd expect. I mean, if you're a, somebody who's sympathetic with Bayesian reasoning, you'd uh, think that it would be extremely surprising uh, if larger doses didn't produce the same effect as tranylcypramine and so on and so on. Uh, so that's risagiline. Oh, there's another new one called Ladostigil. That's a mixed... Is that reversible? I think that might be a reversible drug. And it also inhibits acetylcholinesterase as well, I think. Um but I'm not sure how much that's in use or whether it's even approved in most countries. But of course, people are working on that sort of thing. So that is an area of research and development of MAOI drugs, which is, uh, well, useful because, of course, it does have peripheral relevance to um, the treatment of depression, if, if, if only in the sort of instance that I've just given of people who can occasionally afford to take very large doses of risagiline. Um, I can't think of any other MAOIs that I haven't covered there. Um, except also, perhaps I should make a, just a few quick, a few more quick comments about the selegiline business. Theoretically, of course, the skin patch they've now developed, which is a, a much sounder proposition than the um, sublingual thing, because sublingual drugs uh, substantially, in fact, get absorbed by going down the, into the stomach and not by passing the liver at all, so they don't give the advantages that uh, a proper skin patch will give. The skin patch was developed uh, with some difficulty because it's very important to get the absorption constant and uh, to a desirable level over a significant period of time. So this idea that some people have got that you can get a compounding chemist to you know, crush up selegiline and make it into a paste and stick it on your tummy or something. It's just a no, it's a non-starter, far too unpredictable and, and, and no good. Um, so the selegiline uh, skin patch was developed at considerable difficulty and expense. Uh, and they did do some PET studies to show the extent to which it blocked uh, brain uh, monoamine oxidase. Uh, and uh, it, it blocked, of course, as you'd expect, MAOB much better than MAOA, even even with the skin patch. And I, I think, I can't remember the exact details of the studies that were done. Uh, uh, i trying to remember the name of the lady who, who did them. It won't come to me just at the moment. Uh, I, I've corresponded with her and spoken with her. Um, Brookhaven National Laboratory it was that did it. Anyway, I think the long and the short of it was its inhibition of MAOA was somewhat lower and probably I got the impression that it, it didn't really block monoamine, uh, mon, you know, monoamine oxidase A and B as well as tranylcypramine or phenylzine does when given properly. And that's borne out by its effectiveness. When people ask me the question, should I try selegiline first? My overall view on that is this. It's probably a waste of time for most people. Following the diet isn't that difficult. The drug interactions are pretty easy to deal with unless you're a little challenged in understanding these sorts of things. 
uh, and the effectiveness is likely to be much better. The other factor is that quite a substantial proportion of people who are looking at these kinds of treatments are people who've been pretty exhausted by failed attempts of numerous other ineffective drugs. Sadly, of course, a lot of them have been subjected to multiple trials of different SSRIs, which, in my opinion, is largely pointless. So they're, they're fed up with drugs that don't work, uh, and they want something that works. So when I'm advising them, I'm saying to them, well, look, if you really have got the patience to try it, it might work, but it's highly likely that tranylcypramine will work a lot better, and the downsides, the risks, whatever, aren't really worth taking into serious account, so get on with it and try Parnate. But if people are very apprehensive about the diet or there are other reasons they'd prefer to give selegiline a try first and they, they've got the patience and fortitude to do that, then it's a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, of course, for many people it's prohibitively expensive, especially if you take larger doses. So I think that sums up a balanced approach to deciding whether to try selegiline or whether, to, I mean the selegiline skin patch, uh, or uh, go straight to channel cypramine or, or phenylzine or, 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 or isocarboxazid. Um, uh, back to reminding everyone that I, I tend to say parnate or channel cypramine uh, as a default statement for irreversible MALIs uh, and uh, uh, as I said in the Nardil video uh, most of the statements that you make about MALIs apply to all of them except for the important differences between for instance phenylzine and channel cypramine which I've discussed elsewhere. Uh, I'm just defending myself against the accusation of only ever talking about Parnay. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, I think that covers most of it. I'm sure people will ask questions. Let me just re repeat for people who haven't seen these comments that I've made before. Um, the comment section of YouTube isn't really a suitable place to discuss psychopharmacology. Um, so any uh, significant or complex questions about that are best addressed straight to me. And uh, also bear in mind that you, you can you can Skype me. It's much easier for me to talk than it is for me to type because of my difficulty and yeah, disability and difficulty with all that typing and fiddling with touchpads and just doesn't work for me. Uh, so uh, yes, that's a possibility. And don't forget, of course, uh, if anybody's in the position to make donations to help our efforts on the website, uh, that's always something... Uh, that's necessary and helpful. So uh, I hope that information is of value to various people and I look forward to speaking about something else interesting in the not too distant future. Hopefully Heidi is well enough now to uh, manage to deal with one or two videos. I'm sure you all wish Heidi well. Okay, goodbye for now. Thank mm -hmm. you.